But today, um, I've been thinking about what I wanted to share, and the Lord laid this on my heart. Um, prayer. We need prayer. You need prayer. I need prayer. And, um, and just reflecting on where we've come, uh, how far we've come, and where we're headed, um, I think it's a time and a season opportunity in our church to pray like we've never prayed before. And so that's what I want to talk about today. Let's talk about teach us to pray. Let me pray for us and um, we'll get started. Lord Jesus, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for each of these brothers and sisters that you've brought here today. Lord, I'm sure each and every one of them have a, has a burden, God, upon their, upon their heart. And so, God, I just, we pray to you. We pray to the almighty God who hears insignificant sinners like us when we call on you. And so we cry to you today to meet us in our need, to meet us in our weakness, to meet us in our insufficiency, to meet us with your power, because you are good, and your steadfast love endures forever. Lord, today we pray, as your disciples prayed 2,000 years ago, Lord, teach us to pray. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Yeah, I've been, as I've been reflecting on prayer, I've been, I've been blown away in this whole process, by the number of people who have been praying for us, um, just about everywhere I go, uh, in town and or in or people that I've mentioned it to along the, along and along, they'll ask about how how it's going, how we're doing as a church, and they say, "I've been praying for you." It's uh, it's remarkable. It's unbelievable. There's no. There's not a single doubt in my mind that the reason why we have made it to where we are is through the prayers of the saints. If you don't believe that God is at work, then just look no further than the, the sheer number of people that God has put it upon their hearts to pray for us. You know that's the work of God, right? When people are praying for you, that's because God has put it on their heart to pray for you. Because God wants to do something in and through your life. And so God has been with us, and that's all the more reason to pray all the more. Um, I've, I've likened this journey a lot to, to Peter stepping out of the boat. Um, it's, a huge, it's a huge step of faith. Uh, we give Peter a hard time, uh, but Peter's the only one who stepped out of the boat. So, you know, I mean, there's 11 people, there's 11, I mean, he might have started sinking, but at least he walked on water for a few steps. Uh, that's more than most of us could say. But we do know what happened to Peter, right? He took his eyes off Jesus, and he began to sink. And so what I feel a burden to say today is let's, let's, let's not take our eyes off of Jesus so that we won't begin to sink. We need to look to Jesus more earnestly in prayer than ever before. And that's what I want to talk about from Luke chapter 11. Uh, as Jesus answered his disciples' question, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. If you're able and willing, I invite you to stand and honor the reading of God's word. Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at, mid will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him, and he will answer from within. Do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, 
Yet, because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The word of God. You may be seated. Okay. We're going to look at Jesus... Jesus' instructions on prayer under three headings this morning. Number one, our heart for prayer, our heart for prayer. Number two, our longings for prayer, our longings for prayer. And number three, the God who answers prayer, the God who answers prayer. First, we're going to talk about our heart for prayer. In verse one there, Jesus, uh, it, it says there that Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but isn't it, isn't it just like mind boggling that Jesus prayed? I mean, you ever think about the Trinity and you're just like, well, is Jesus praying to himself? Like, how does that work? Uh, it, it's mind boggling, right? God, the son incarnate prays to God, the father. But let me tell you something. If Jesus needed to pray. How much more do we need to pray? If Jesus needed to pray, how much more do we need to pray? Jesus was a man of prayer. He would get away alone. He had to try to, he had to like try to hide from people just so he could find time to pray. But he did it because he was a man of prayer. He knew that he needed prayer. I think we have to be honest and say that if there is a weakness in the Western church, It's probably our prayer, prayer life. Jesus prayed all night long before he chose his disciples. It was not uncommon, as we see in the book of Acts, for the early church to have all night prayer meetings. Uh, Paul preached someone to death, uh, fell asleep out and fell out the window. Okay? All night. All right? It wasn't uncommon for them to have all night prayer meetings. Um, our brother, uh, Derek Johns, um, whom you know, our, a missionary in the Philippines, a, a, a hero of mine. Um, if you have kept up with him uh, during around the time of, of, of COVID, I believe, they decided to start praying together daily every morning as a church. They have not ceased to do that every day for years now. Every day. At least some group from among their church gathers together every morning to pray. And that has not ceased for years now. And Derek has, uh, in just conversation, he's, he's reached out to me and has taken an interest in what the Lord is doing here. And he told me that the, just the Lord has put it upon his heart. And so he, he has shared what's going on here with his church. And they pray for us. At their daily prayer meetings in the Philippines. That's the body of Christ. That's 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 the kingdom being bigger than what's going on in Eastman, what's going on in the Philippines. We're all in this together. That's God at work burning people's heart to see his kingdom grow in every place where it is. And that's the reason why we've made it this far. And it's the only uh <clears throat> It's, it's the thing that's going to bring to fruition the seeds of change we're planting in the soil of our church. So we must learn to pray. You see, the disciples, it says Jesus was playing, praying in a certain place. And the, the disciples saw Jesus praying and they connected the dots. It, it, it couldn't have been that hard, right? Here is a man who has unco- incomparable spiritual power and yet they don't just merely attribute it to um, his divinity. I'm sure that was not quite as clear to them as it was to us. What they, what they do see about him was his prayer life. And they connect the dots and they say, 
Well, at least part of the reason why Jesus is the way he is is because he prays. And so they say, Lord, teach me to pray. They, they, can, they, can, they can look at Jesus and see the, the spiritual anemia of their own life in comparison to Jesus. And so they ask him for what they know is part of the solution. Lord, teach us to pray. And so I just encourage you just as in, in your heart right now and in our hearts as a church, let's just say in our hearts right now, Lord, teach us to pray. Make us a praying people. Teach us to pray, Lord. If we're going to see a mighty move of God as people saw in Jesus' day, it was through prayer. Jesus, before he started his ministry, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights praying to God. For the, Jesus, the, 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 Jesus agonized over what God called him to do. And that's how he had the ability to do it. If we're going to see a mighty move of God, it's going to be seized by prayer. And so we have to say, Lord, teach us to pray. You know, Charles Spurgeon if, it was the Baptist patron saint, if, if we believe in such things. And, um, but great man of God, probably the greatest English-speaking preacher who ever lived. Way before the days of megachurches, they had a megachurch. Thousands and thousands of people got saved under his ministry there at the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London. Uh, and there's this famous story that I believe is worth sharing. It, uh, it goes like this. It says, one day five college students visited London, uh, and, and one Sunday they wanted to hear Charles Spurgeon preach at the Metropolitan Tabernacle. And so they arrived early, and they were met by a kind gentleman who offered to give them a tour of the facilities. And at one point, he asked them if they'd like to see the furnace room in the basement. And it was July, and so they were not really that keen on seeing the furnace, but they didn't want to be rude. So they're like, sure, you can show us the furnace, okay? And so, and so their guide quietly led them down to the basement and opened the door there in the furnace room, and there were several hundred people praying. Well, it turns out that their guide was Charles Spurgeon himself, And he wanted them to see why God moved so mightily in their church. It's because they had people praying every Sunday for their services. He wanted them to understand the power of the ministry that God had given them there. So when you see great movements of God anywhere, in any church, the human tendency is to think, well, they're just gifted, or there's just charisma, or they just did all the right things. And I mean, don't get me wrong, that's part of it. But let me tell you something. If God is moving, it's because people have been praying. And God can do a little with a lot when there's prayer. I said that backwards. God can do a lot with a little. <laughs> Y'all knew what I meant, though. <laughs> God can do a lot with a little. When there's prayer. So Lord, teach us to pray. So number one, we have to have the heart for prayer, our heart for prayer. Number two, as Jesus instructs them to pray, he tells us, he tells us what our longings for prayer should be. And this is epitomized in in what we now call the Lord's Prayer. Luke's version reads this, says, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. So Jesus is giving them a model and he says, Lord, teach us to pray. He's teaching them how to pray. Um, and now, now it's, it's a model. Um, I mean, you can recite it and that's a, it's, it's great to recite. I encourage you to recite the Lord's prayer, but it's not just a, something to be recited. It's a model to to, to take and to, to shape our, our thoughts and our hearts and our minds and our longings and to get, and, and to give us a, 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 a sounding board and a launching pad to, to express our own cries to God. But he, he tells us here, um, he tells us here what the, what the great cries of the Christian heart should be. The Lord's Prayer is remarkable for a few reasons. It's remarkable for its brevity. It's pretty short. 
God's not nearly as concerned with how long you pray as he is with your heart in praying. It's brief. It's, it, it, it's about the heart. It's not super long. In fact, Jesus condemned those people who just prayed long prayers just to look spiritual. It's brief. Number two, it's remarkable for its simplicity. It's simplicity. You don't, you don't have to be a theological scholar to understand it. You know, some people, you know, I, I, you don't, you don't, you don't have to use fancy words when you pray. God's not impressed by that. God knows every language. He's not impressed by that. You just pray your heart. In fact, the, the most profound and beautiful prayers I've ever heard are, have been the simplest prayers. And this, the Lord's Prayer is a simple prayer. It's brief, it's simple, and, and, and it's remarkable finally because it's profound. It's profound. It gives voice to the deepest issues of the Christian faith, and that's what we're going to talk about as we look at it a little bit closely. These are the things that we are most to be concerned about, right? When Jesus is teaching us to pray, what is he saying? He's saying, look, if you're going to pray, the, here, are the, here are some of the primary things that you should pray about. That doesn't mean that's the only things you, you can or should pray for. But here are, the, here are the greatest concerns that should be on your heart as Christians so that when you do pray, it should, it sh- it should include these matters of huge uh, theological significance, profound importance. It's a test of our priorities, right? It's a question of, do our priorities align with God's priorities? Do our priorities align with Jesus' priorities? When Jesus is teaching us to pray, he's saying, look, these are the things you need to be primarily concerned about. Okay, and this is what they are. Number one, the first priority of a follower of Christ, according to Jesus, is that the name of God be hallowed. Now, the word, the verb, hallow, is an old school verb. We don't use that verb except in the Lord's Prayer nowadays. But it's from the same root as the adjective holy. So to hallow something means to honor it, to see it, to revere it, to cherish it as holy. When we pray, because God is holy. Holy is your name. We just sang. So when we pray, When we pray for God's name to be hallowed, what are we praying for? We're praying that people and that the world would see God for who he really is. That's the greatest and most important thing we can pray for. God, let your name be hallowed. Because let your name be revered as holy because your name is holy. So wherever your name is not seen and honored and revered as holy, let them see you, God, for who you are. That's the greatest cry of the Christian heart. Because one, God is worthy of all the adoration and praise of every human being that exists. And number two, our greatest joy and peace and satisfaction comes from knowing God as he truly is. And so the greatest longing of the Christian heart is that God's name be hallowed. He is holy, holy, holy. There is none like him. So that's our first priority. Hallowed be his name. The second priority is for the coming of the kingdom of God. So just just, so just think in your prayer lives, in our prayer lives, does our prayer lives reflect the priorities of God's name being hallowed? Do they fr- reflect the priority? of the coming of the kingdom of God. Jesus taught us to pray for that. But what does that mean? The kingdom of God, we, we went through the book of Matthew where he talked at great two years worth of length about the kingdom of God. But what is the kingdom of God? It, the kingdom of God is, is, is God's manifest rule and reign in the world. And so remember that the kingdom was a kind of a mysterious thing, right? Uh, Jesus said that it was like a mustard seed, that it started out small, but then it would grow. It was like leaven, okay? And so in other words, the ki- and then Jesus would say some weird things like uh, the kingdom the kingdom is in your midst, okay? And so what is, what is he talking about? Where the kingdom is God's manifest rule in the world. The, the brute fact of reality is that Jesus is king. 
that, that, that he does reign. But, but here's the rub. Not everybody acknowledges that. Not everybody acknowledges Jesus' reign. Not everybody acknowledges Jesus' rule. But wherever his reign is acknowledged, there the kingdom of God is. So wherever people have repented of their sins and trusted in Christ and are following and serving and obeying him, there is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God grows. That's what he said. It grows like a mustard seed. It spreads like leaven. It spreads. It's not, you know, in their mind, they thought, you know, a a kingdom comes in like, a mighty war, and it just conquers everybody else and just takes over. But Jesus said that the kingdom does take over, but not in the way that you expect. It takes over, it takes over less like an invading army and takes over more like um, weeds in your garden. It just takes over, slowly but surely. And that's what he's saying. It, it just takes over. Wherever, when we preach the gospel and people come to... to a right knowledge of God, and they turn from their sins and trust in Christ, there the kingdom of God has grown. And we should pray and we should long for the kingdom of God to come. And of course, one day the kingdom will be consummated. That means that the kingdom will grow until it reaches a point where the final person will be saved. And the Bible says that. It says that Jesus will not return until the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. There will be, there is some appointed person out there who will be the last person to repent of their sins and believe in Christ. And then Jesus Christ will come back. And when he comes back, he will, he will set up his full and final kingdom. But see, at that point, when Jesus comes back to set up his kingdom, there, rebellion will no longer be tolerated. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And at that day, and we pray for God's kingdom to come. That's why the book of Revelation, John says, come Lord Jesus. Why? Because part of the reason for Christians is because we want people to be saved. And then the other part of the reason is because we want God's kingdom to come because life is hard. Because life hurts. And there's pain, and there's sorrow, and there's suffering. And it's, but it's not always going to be that way. And when Jesus comes back, he's going to remove all pain and sorrow and suffering from this world. And he will vindicate our faith. So any, any suffering, any wrong, any uh, um, what time we were maligned, or any way we suffered for Christ will be vindicated in our faith, and we'll be rewarded and honored, just like Jesus said when talking about the servants, when he he gave to the servants the talents, and he comes back and he says, you've been faithful and little, I'll set you over much. That's the kingdom of God. And so we should pray, Lord, let your kingdom come. We love our neighbor and we preach Christ and lead people to faith. We build his kingdom as we await the day when his kingdom will come fully. When God will deliver us from sin and all its effects. And we won't have to worry about this anymore. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more political ads on TV. (laughs) Jesus will be the undisputed president, prime minister, king of the world forever. So we pray for hallowed be his name. We pray that the kingdom of God would come. And then we do pray, and Jesus, and this is important, for our daily needs. God is a practical God. That, that's why it's, so, it's just such a wonderful prayer because it's so simple and yet profound. We pray to God to give us our daily food because God is the one who feeds us. The, the, the prayer, by including this in his model prayer, Jesus is reminding us every time we think about it, every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, it is a reminder to our hearts that if we ate today, it is because God has fed us. And not only that, but, you know, he's, he's specific. I think every word is intentional. The daily bread seems to imply that, that we, it implies the sense that we should be content with what we need for today. 
We should be content. It, it harkens back to the, to the manna that God gave Israel in the wilderness that they were not allowed to gather more than one day or else it uh, became rotten and bred worms and stank because they, they, because they were supposed to wake up every morning expecting God to feed them, trusting in God to feed them. They weren't supposed to store up and save because it was a what? It was a daily practical reminder that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That, that God was going to provide for them every day. And that's the thing. It, it was a lesson, right? That they should trust God every day and not lean on their own strength. And that's the danger that we have. In, in, in the wealthiest, most prosperous country that has ever existed in human history, it can be very tempting to trust in our bank accounts and in our insurance policies and not trust in God. But God is the one who feeds us. And we should pray for that. God cares about our daily needs. And we should pray for that. And, that, uh, uh, and of course, that means our, uh, we can use our excess to meet others' needs as well. So, hallowed be his name, the coming of the kingdom, our daily needs. And then the fourth and, and final thing, the great longing of the Christian heart, is forgiveness of sin. It's forgiveness of sin and deliverance from it. If we want, if we want our God's name to be honored as holy, then we as his people must be holy. And we want to be holy. For our God, because he is holy. And so Jesus built this in to our prayer to ask for forgiveness because that's the greatest human need. There are lots of great needs, but the greatest human need is forgiveness of sin. Lord, forgive me of my trespasses. That's the great need of the world. Not more stuff, not better politics. Forgiven sin. That's the great need of the world. And what's interesting there is that built into the Lord's Prayer, right? It says, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Well, what is it? You know, it, it's, it's a statement. We ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Well, why would Jesus include that? Well, he's basically saying this. You cannot ask for forgiveness of your sins unless you're ready to forgive other people of their sins. Because you can't pray that. You can't pray for we forgive every one of their sins. If you don't do that, and you, you, it's the whole package deal. So in, in essence, Jesus is saying, don't you come asking me for forgiveness when you refuse to forgive others. It's built in there. That's our great need. And so God's forgiveness must change us into forgiving people. And of course, and then he, he finally says, lead us not into temptation. Because a Christian, a true Christian, doesn't want to sin. A sinning Christian is a miserable Christian. For those who have truly been reborn by the Spirit of God, he won't lit up. And he'll throw the kitchen sink at you if he has to. So we need to pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation. Forgive me of my sin. So what do we say with the disciples? We say, Lord, teach us to pray. And Lord, teach us to prioritize what God prioritizes. So I encourage you, as you, as you pray, take, take the Lord's Prayer. Open it up. Use it as a model. As you pray every day. So number one, our heart for prayer. Number two, our longing for prayer. And then finally, number three, the God who answers prayer. The God who answers prayer. This is, Jesus continues with this um, parable. He says, which of you has a friend who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, don't bother me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you. Though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, 
and the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So Jesus, in this parable, explains one of the simplest, and I think probably most life-changing truths that there is in Scripture, and that is God answers prayer. God answers prayer. You can tell how much you believe God answers prayer by how much you pray. But Jesus is telling us God answers prayer. He uses this illustration of a man who has a surprise drop-in from a friend. Now, in this time, in this culture, hospitality was, was just a massive part of that culture, and it would have been uh, embarrassing and probably even humiliating to have a friend show up and not have any, any, anything to give them. And so he's like, he's like, he's like horrified, and, and is, you know, it's kind of like a shameful kind of thing. He's like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And so he runs down to his neighbor's house in the middle of the night, all right? Now, I'm assuming most of you know that, that 2,000 square foot homes is a modern invention. All right? And so most people had one, maybe two rooms in their house, and they all shared living quarters, so literally they're just sleeping all together. Okay? And then it's the middle of the night, you got a tiny little house, someone starts banging on the door. You're like, what in the world is going on? And then you're like, what is it? And he's like, I need some bread. And you're like, what? Go away. But he just knocks and 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 knocks. Well, what happens? That man gets his bread. Why? Because his friend loves him? No, because he annoyed him to death. He just wanted him to go away. So he gave him some bread. So what's the point? What's the point? The point is not that God is an annoyed neighbor. The point is that if an annoyed neighbor will give you what you ask for, how much more will God, who loves to answer prayer, give you what you ask for when you pray to him? If an annoyed neighbor will give you what you want just, to, just so you'll leave him alone, how much more the God who loves to answer prayer will answer his children who call on him? And so what's the point? The point is to not give up in our praying because we have a father who delights to answer prayer, who doesn't get annoyed. In fact, the more we knock, the more he likes it. So don't stop praying. Don't stop praying for your lost friends and family members. Don't stop. Don't stop. You don't know what God's going to do. Don't give up. Don't stop praying for our church. Don't stop praying that God would use us to reach lost souls for Christ. Don't stop praying that God would bring us uh, the right people to serve in the right places to make us as effective as possible in making disciples. Don't stop praying that God would help you in that struggle that you have or in this pain that you're dealing with or whatever it is. Don't stop praying because God answers prayer. Jesus continues with another illustration about human parenting. And he says even human fathers know how to give good gifts to their children. And notice Jesus, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't pull any punches here. He says, if you then, who are evil. So he's basic. So, so, I mean, Jesus believes in human depravity here. All right? Even people like us. All right? Even people who don't respect God, who live basically for themselves and for the world, who aren't, may, aren't even concerned in the least for God. Even people, 
They can be decent parents. And thank God for that. But Jesus is, Jesus is making a point. His point is that if we, people like us, know how to give good things to our children, how much more does God, how much more will God give, get this, the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, I, I, I chose Luke on purpose because Matthew says good things. But Luke says Holy Spirit. And I think that's because Luke tends to emphasize the Holy Spirit more than the other Gospels, uh, especially in the book of Acts. And it's Luke's way of telling us, telling us Jesus' theology that what, what greater thing can God give us than the Holy Spirit? What greater thing can God give us than the Holy Spirit? I think in our praying, my burden in our praying, and I encourage you in your praying to pray that God would give us the Holy Spirit. Because it's the Holy Spirit who changes hearts. It's the Holy Spirit who changes us, who changed us. It's the Holy Spirit who turns us away from the world to Christ. It's the Holy Spirit who gives us earnestness and zeal and hunger and thirst for God. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us a longing for God's name to be hallowed and for his kingdom to come. It's the Holy Spirit who saves lost souls. It's the Holy Spirit who helps saints out of the quagmire of sin. It's the Holy Spirit who takes Saul's and turns them into Paul's. It's the Holy Spirit who does it all. And, and the thing that would make the biggest difference in our lives, in our church today, is if we were more full of the Holy Spirit. There's no doubt in my mind. If we're going to do anything that, as a church, matters, that will matter a billion years from now, and we can, it'll be by the Holy Spirit of God. So let's pray. Let's long to pray. Let's, let's with the disciples, say, Lord, teach us to pray, and let's not give up praying. And in you and in your life, and whatever specific burdens that you have on your heart, don't give up praying. Say, Lord, teach me to pray. Because we have a God who answers prayer. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you answered the greatest possible prayer, Lord, that could be prayed. Think of the Apostle Paul in... The book of Romans, who said, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through our Lord Jesus Christ. You hear prayer and you answer prayer. You have answered, met our greatest need, the forgiveness of sins, through your death on the cross and your resurrection from the dead. And now, Lord, as your children... We have the privilege, the privilege, God, to call on you, on a God who answers prayer. So, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach me to pray, God. Teach us to pray, to seek you earnestly, to call out to you, to not give up, to not grow weary. And in so doing, Lord, we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit, God, upon us. That you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. That you would remove from us sin, God, and worldliness. That you would fill us with love and earnestness and zeal. That you would give your Holy Spirit, God, and work in the hearts of our lo lost friends and family members, God, who we so desperately long that they might know you. 
God, we pray that you would work in our church, Lord, that you would use us in ways beyond all that we could ask or imagine to bring your kingdom come, to bring, to let your name be hallowed here in this community. God, you are able by your Holy Spirit. And so we ask for more in Jesus' name.